Okay, let's start in... Uh, we did not get through the whole chapter of John last week because this is such a big chapter. And instead of... I've been praying as we've been going through this. You know, I had planned on covering one whole chapter every week, but sometimes there's just so much in it. I don't really want to just go through it way too fast and then miss some of the things that God really wants to teach us. So we're going to focus on the second half or the end of chapter five, um, because we really need to see it's important what Jesus is revealing to us here. Because ultimately, we're going to see in this passage that all of Scripture, the whole Bible, from the very first book in the Bible, Genesis, all the way to the very last book, Revelation, the whole of the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. Even the Old Testament, before Jesus came down out of heaven into this earth, in the book of Genesis, we'll actually look at this today, there was, there was Scripture that was prophesying and pointing ahead to the Savior, the one who would come and restore everything and make everything right. Because when God created everything in the beginning, He created everything to be perfectly good and right and perfect relationship with Him. God actually would come down out of heaven and He would, he would walk on the earth and spend time with Adam and Eve they had perfect relationship. There was no sin. There was no sickness, no death, no violence. Everything was perfect. But then God did give a test to Adam and Eve. He put the one tree in the garden and said, do not eat of this one tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you will die. And that word die or to, for the word for death really means separation. And in the scriptures, you as you study the scriptures, you see that there's three kinds of death spoken of in the Bible. There's physical death, which is when our bodies die. There's spiritual death, which is our soul, our spirit, who we really are, where we are separated from God spiritually. And you can have spiritual death even though you're physically alive. There's people who are spiritually separated from God, even though they're physically not dead yet. And then there's ultimately eternal death, which is separation from God forever that never ends, both physical and spiritual separation from God in hell and ultimately the lake of fire spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. So Jesus came to restore and to almost, uh, in a sense, erase all the wrong that has been done and set everything back to the way that he originally designed it to be when he first created Adam and Eve. But in order for that to happen, Jesus, it was told that he would have to come and actually take death on himself and be separated from his father to substitute himself in our place so that we don't have to receive what we deserve. Someone has to pay for our sins. But Jesus was willing to pay for it for us so that he could restore our relationship back to the way that he originally designed for everyone. God, God originally designed everything to, to live forever. And everyone will live forever one day somewhere, according to the scriptures. But not everyone will live with God in heaven. In fact, the Bible teaches that more people re will reject Jesus. Jesus said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. So there's a huge gate that people are going through, going away from the true God, and they're going to the place of death and eternal separation from God. And Jesus said, and narrow, that means small, is the door or the gate. Small is the gate that leads to life, and there are very few who will find it. So Jesus came because he does not, he, he wants his gate to be wide. Now he knows all things. He wants, he wants his gate to be wide in the sense he wants all people to come and believe in him. But he gives each of us a choice. Remember, we talked about that last week, how it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, 
It, God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And God says, choose life. He, he's telling us, choose. You have a choice. Choose life. Okay? So today we're going to look at these people who were listening to Jesus. They were hanging on to their religion. Their, their rules and their rituals and their practices that they were taught from the time they were growing up as little babies and then continuing. I mean, the generation after generation of the Jews, they had God's Word, the Old Testament. We're going to see this today. They had the Pentateuch, the books of Moses that Moses wrote, which were ultimately all speaking about Jesus. But instead of looking for who Jesus was, they were just looking for a bunch of things to do to try to make them right with God. And Jesus will see, he will tell them. You search these scriptures because you think in them you're going to have eternal life, but these scriptures speak of me. And he says, you're not willing to come to me to have life. So ultimately, all of scripture is about Jesus. Okay, so what we're going to look at is uh, in John chapter 5, the end here, Jesus will tell us there's five witnesses, five different things or people that speak to who he is. Because, and he will give this argument. He will say, if I speak about myself and say that I am Yahweh, the Messiah, the Savior, that, that I am God, then how are you going to believe me if I'm the only one who says it? But if others say it, and ultimately God, the Father, says it, then you better believe it. Okay, and he's going to show us, we're going to work through, that he, Jesus is not just claiming himself to be God. Others, all of Scripture has proved it. Okay, so the, I'll, we'll go through the five witnesses. I'll just tell you right now. So Jesus himself says who he is. John the Baptist, we'll see, proclaims who he is. Uh, God the Father proclaims who He is. We won't see this in John, but it's in uh, some of the other Gospels where God the Father speaks out of heaven and says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay? So Jesus says who He is. John the Baptist says who He is. God the Father says who He is. Okay? Moses says who He is. And ultimately, all of the Scriptures say who He is. Okay, so we're going to work through these, and uh, this is what we're going to spend our time today. So we will start. Um, keep in mind, as we're working through this, the three questions that we always ask. Okay, so what does this story or passage reveal about who Jesus is? We're going to see five different witnesses who, who speak about who Jesus is and what he has ultimately come to do. And how do the people respond? We're going to see in John chapter 5, uh, most of the people reject who Jesus is or who he claims to be and who he says the others claim him to be. And what is the result of what is revealed about who Jesus is? So let's jump into it. Okay, now remember last week we had ended, if you go back to the previous verses, Jesus had just claimed that God the Father has given him all authority to judge. So on the day of judgment in Revelation chapter 20, when it says that the, the dead, great and small, have, have risen from the dead and they are standing in front of God in judgment, at judgment day. Okay? And Jesus is the one who will be sitting on the throne, who will be looking at each person and judging. Okay? Now, Jesus also said, we, it was the very previous verse, verse 29. Okay? He's giving a description of the kind of people that are risen from the dead and the place they will go. And he says, those who have done good will rise to a judgment of life, and those who have done evil will rise to a judgment to, or to, the ju to a judgment to a place of punishment. And I was explaining last week, Jesus was not saying if you're a good person, you go to heaven. If you're a bad person, you go to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's giving a description of the type of person 
that will end up in each of these places. And we know ultimately from the scriptures, it teaches that we all are bad. We all have sin. We all deserve judgment. But when we choose life, when we choose Jesus, then our sins are washed away and God has given us a new heart and he's changed us. And we now are ultimately what Jesus calls a good tree or a child of God who bears good fruit. So this is a description. It's describing the kind of person that will enter into eternal life with God. The one who ultimately accepts Jesus and and who bears fruit, good fruit. The result of someone coming to Jesus is the natural outcome of our life will be good. He's not saying that we're going to be perfect, but and also the natural outcome of a person who rejects God is evil and bad. Okay. now again, this is a a description. It's not a prescription. Do you know what a prescription is? Like if you go to the pharmacist and you're sick and you say, I need you to prescribe for me a drug or a, uh, you know, a, a medicine or something that will help me get better. A prescription. So the pharmacist says, do this, 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 and this, and then your headache will go away. Take this pill. So that's a prescription. So it's telling us what we need to do to get help. So the prescription for having eternal life is put your trust in Jesus. That's the prescription. But a description, something that describes the type of person that has put their faith in Jesus is good will come. The fruit, you can read about this in in Galatians chapter uh, 5, I think it is. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe some of you have read love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that's a description of good that comes out of the life of a believer who has the Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit and fruit comes. Those who reject Jesus, good can't come. Jesus talked about this in uh, Luke 7, I think it was. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So when Jesus says those who have done good in verse 29 will rise to a judgment or to, to life and those who have done evil will rise to a place of judgment. And he's the one that determines Ultimately, our destination. Now, we know that his word says if you choose life, if you choose Jesus, then he will his fruit will come out of our lives. His his good works will come. Not perfectly all the time, but God will begin to change us and good will come. That's a description of the kind of person that rises to life. The kind of person that rises to death and judgment is the one who rejects Jesus. They continue like these people were reading about. They were trusting in their religion. And ultimately, they were very, very angry and hateful. And, you know, they wanted to kill Jesus. So we're coming from that context here. Okay. And let's start reading. He says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. The word just means right or fair. Um, some of you, I don't know, when you're, when you're a child and your parents, uh, you, maybe you have a brother or a sister and your parents let your brother or sister do one thing and they tell you you can't do it. And what do you say? That's not fair. I don't know if you, <laughs> you've done that. Of course, in your own languages. Okay. That's not fair. You let him have two pieces of chocolate and you only let me have one. My sons do that all the time. Don't you boys? (laughs) They're like groaning in their ES. Okay. You know, that's not fair. Right. And and what do we do when we're parents? We're like, life isn't fair. Get over it. (laughs) No, but God does everything fair, meaning he gives you exactly or He gives what is deserved. Like if you deserve something, he gives it. But he's also willing to ultimately take what we deserve. So if we deserve to be 
to, to die and be separated from him, Jesus was also willing to come and take that in our place. Okay? So, for instance, I don't know in your cultures how your parents disciplined you when you were young. Uh, like when you got in trouble. Um, some cultures, like in, in our culture, when I was young, if I did something wrong, boom, boom, I got a whooping. Like, did, did you? <laughs> with, a, with a little switch or a spoon or a hand or something. A stick, <laughs> you know? So you got the punishment that you that was fair. Like your parents said, you know, don't do this and you will be punished. <laughs> right? Okay, so think about this. Jesus, ultimately, he says on the day of judgment, people will be put to, those who don't trust in Jesus will be put to shame and they will be punished and separated from God. Okay, but Jesus was willing to take that for us. So when he died on the cross, he was put to shame, to open shame. Okay, and he was punished. Okay, but what Jesus is saying here, this is before he, he died on the cross. He's trying to teach them and he's trying to teach us something about himself. He's the one who gets to decide what happens to each of us. And he will, he will decide all uh, the choices that God makes are always right. Jesus is going to be fair. No one can stand in front of God on the day of judgment and say, that's not fair, God. I don't deserve that. We will all stand in front of God knowing. Okay, but if you're a believer and follower of Jesus, we will stand in front of God with no shame. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. It's a good verse to memorize. It says, those who put their trust in him will never be put to shame. So on the day of judgment for us as followers of Jesus, it's not a judgment of God's going to shame you and reveal all your sins because your sin has been washed away in Jesus. God dealt with your sin when he died on the cross. And he gives you a perfect, clean Clean record, like if you have a, um, a criminal record, you know, like in your country, you have a record that shows, you know, you're, if you've committed a crime, like if you've stolen or done anything and you've been caught, then you have a, a criminal record. Well, God, the Bible says the book of works was open and everything that was written in the book, those were judged according to all things written in the book. But our sin was placed on Christ at the cross and he washed away all our sins. So when it says, Jesus says, I, as I hear, I judge and my judgment is just, everything that Jesus does is perfectly right. So he wants us to understand we need to have a proper fear of God and understanding that God will judge our sin. Now Jesus took the judgment for us if you don't accept Jesus, you, have, you will have to pay for your sin. If you come to Christ and put your trust in Him and repent of your sin and follow Him, then you will not be judged for your sin. Praise God, right? For that? Okay, let's keep moving on because i got to go through this quick. Verse 31, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There, okay, so what he's saying is, if I'm the only one that says... I'm, I have authority. I am God. I have authority to forgive sins. I have authority over life and death. I'm the one who will judge me, you on judgment day. If he's the only one that's saying this, he's saying, don't believe me. Okay. Now, there are many people who say that they're the Messiah. Jesus said, many will come after me and say, I am the Messiah. Follow me. There's a... Uh, I don't know in your countries, but like in my country, there's been people who have done this. I think there was somebody. Is it in, in Nepal? There's somebody that like claims to be the Messiah and he has a, a big following. It's in one of your countries. Joshua, Pastor Joshua was telling me about it. Yeah, yeah, and then and then some of these uh, 
these they're called false false prophets. They will proclaim, I, I'm the Messiah, the one come. And they usually ask for money and stuff. And it's very deceptive. Okay? So Jesus says, if I just say that I'm the Messiah on my own, but no one else says, don't don't believe. It's not true. But he, he's going to say five different, besides himself, four different people who testify. Okay? So verse 32, there is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about, about me is true. You sent to John... Now, he's talking about John the Baptist here, not John the Apostle who wrote this book, but John the Baptist. You sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things to you that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Okay, now we saw John the Baptist in... John chapter 2, a little bit. The book of John doesn't talk a lot about this man, John the Baptist, but you can read about him in some of the other Gospels. And we know that ultimately, John the Baptist came, as the Scripture prophesied in the Old Testament, as someone who would prepare the way for the Lord. And all that meant was, when a king would get ready to come into a town, for whatever reason that he might leave his his castle where he lived, and he would go enter into another town. They would send someone ahead of time and tell the, the town, the king is coming, prepare. And what the town would do, they would clean up, they would cook a lot of food, and they would prepare like a big feast and a banquet to welcome the king to come. So the person's job that would go ahead of the king into the city, their job was just to say, hey, the king is going to come. You need to get yourselves ready, get the food ready, and he's coming. So John the Baptist, his job was to say, hey, the king of heaven is coming. Get yourselves ready. And what John preached, the way you get yourself ready is repent of your sins. Okay, that means turn away. Turn away from your idols. Turn away from trusting in your own good works. Turn to the living God. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Recognize your need for this Savior. So John came, and we saw in John chapter 1, that he, when, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he was like, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is saying, I'm not just saying that I'm the Messiah. John the Baptist said that I was. And he's also going to move on and say, Okay, but the testimony that I have given is greater than that of even John. See, John was just a man, a good, a good prophet, a man that God sent. Okay? He says, For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So what Jesus is saying here is, all these miracles that the people are seeing, they prove who Jesus is. Who can just walk up to someone and say, Be healed. Your eyes are are opened, okay? Who can say to the dead, rise? Okay? Who can, who can say to the lame man that we saw at the beginning of John chapter 5, remember? It said he was sick for 38 years and he couldn't walk and Jesus, Jesus just says, take up your bed and walk. So Jesus is saying, my works that I do, <laughs> the, the power that he is 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 showing us and revealing us, he's like, they, they're proof. I mean, who, who can just come and do these things that only God can do? We'll see in John chapter 6 also, he's going to feed 5,000 people with five pieces of bread and two fish. And then right after that, the next day or that night, he's going to walk on the water out to the disciples in the boat in the middle of a storm. So Jesus is saying, hey, if you don't believe me because I say I'm, I'm the Savior, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, believe the things that I do. Because no man has power over life and death. Only God does. Jesus in uh, Mark chapter, I think it was uh, chapter 2, 
There was a, a man who needed to be healed and he was preaching in a, a house and there was a ton of people in the house. And there was a man who was paralyzed, meaning he couldn't walk. And his friends take him up on the roof and they take, they literally peel the roof off and they lower their friend down to Jesus. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And then the people say, this is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins except God alone? And that was the point Jesus was making, that he has authority because he is God the Son. He has authority to forgive sins because he is God the Son. Okay, so he's saying, John the Baptist told you who I am. My own good works, my own miracles are speaking, revealing who I am. Okay, and then let's see who else. Okay, now he's saying even his own father, God the Father, is revealing who Jesus is, who is speaking. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one he has sent. Okay, now he's being real hard on them, Jesus is, because he's these people, the Jewish people... They claim to, to follow the true God. So the God of the Old Testament. So they had the word of God that was written at their time. And so they claimed we, we follow Jehovah, Yahweh, the God who made the heavens and the earth. But what Jesus is saying is you don't even know him. Because you don't accept me because I came from him. Because ultimately he is... God the Son, right? God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, in Christianity, we call this the Trinity, right? The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So Jesus is God the Son who's come down. So he's saying, my Father even says who I am. And again, as I mentioned before, in, uh, it's called the Transfiguration. It's, we don't see it in the book of John. But it's in, uh, I believe it's Matthew and one of the other Gospels. I, I, I can't remember. But where Moses goes up on the mountain. I'm sorry, not Moses. Where Jesus and James and John, they go up on this mountain. And all of a sudden, Jesus transforms into this. All his clothes turn white and he turns. There's a bright light and they hear a voice speak out from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So God the Father was speaking. Hey, don't just believe anyone who says that they're the Savior, they're the Messiah. Okay, but Jesus himself said it. He revealed it through his good works. John the Baptist said it. And now God the Father says it. So we need to let when we look at the scriptures and we see what it's revealing about Jesus, we need to we need to believe it. We need to accept it. Okay, all right, let's continue moving on. Verse 39, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about this, okay? He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So what Jesus is saying, the Jews had the Old Testament. It was called the Torah. Uh, they had the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books, which Moses wrote. They had um, what were called the historic books like Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, all those books. Then they had the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, Daniel, all of those. They had all of those. And Jesus is saying, you looked at those and you were just looking for what you thought you could do to get eternal life. You think it's about you and what you do. And if you think all of you think about your religions that you have come from or that your uh, cultures have taught you, it's all about what you do, right? It's all about good works. It's all about appeasing the gods, uh, putting forth sacrifices, doing good things and and every religion kind of has their own 
you know, view and list of rules and rituals and things that you need to do, right? Because it's all about what the person does. And even the Jews who claim to follow the true God, that's what they thought. Oh, we need to look at these and we need to obey this and this and this and this and this and this. And even ultimately, the Ten Commandments that God gave that he wants us to obey. If you read the book of Romans, it even tells us that it's not by obeying those things that were made right with God. God wants us to obey him out of love for him. But obeying those things don't make us right with him. Jesus makes us right with him, and then he gives us his spirit and power to be able to obey. Okay, there's a difference. We don't do good works to get salvation, to, to become right with God. But once we come to Jesus and we become right with him, then we will do good works. It's something that just comes out. Because if Jesus is in you, then you begin to start living like him. So he wants us to do good. But what he's telling them is, you think that just by reading all these rules and things, and if you do all these things, that you're going to have eternal life. And he says, look what he says. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But these are they that bear witness about me. Ultimately, the whole Old Testament is, is all about Jesus. Okay? And he says, and you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying, you want to do all, all these good things and be religious, but you don't want me. Okay, if you don't want me, you don't get eternal life. Jesus is is equal to eternal life. If you want eternal life, you have to come to Jesus. You can't separate Jesus and eternal life. Okay, because in Jesus comes life. Without Jesus, there's death, separation from God. Jesus is the one who unites us to God the Father. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, there is one mediator, one person that takes us to God. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the only one that can bring us to God. Okay? So, let's look at this. Jesus is also going to explain something else. He says, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So what he's saying is these religious people, they like to go around and, and tell each other how good they were. You know, like when they put money in the offering. Ooh, good job. <laughs> you are such a good person. God must really love you because you put a lot of money in there. <laughs> right? And then if you put a little bit in there, mm, look how much you put in there. See, they were judging each other. They were trying to receive glory and honor from each other. You're good. No, you're bad. Okay? They were, they, they were putting themselves in the place to judge. And Jesus is telling them, you don't even know God. You guys all, you just do all your religious things. You don't even know the true God. He, he says, you don't have the love of God in your hearts. Now, can you imagine how you would feel if you had lived your whole life believing that by doing all these good things that you were right with God and then someone comes along and tells you none of that is any good. And any of you, many of you know that because you grew up, some of you in, in other religions. And so... When you come to face the truth of who Jesus is, you all of a sudden you realize everything I grew up to believe and did, it didn't do me any good. All those prayers and sacrifices to the idols, that, that doesn't do any good, right? So this is a hard thing to accept, isn't it? It's, when you first hear this, it's like, wow, everything that I thought made me good, it didn't really work. It didn't make me good. And so, but Jesus, he, he's convicting them of their sin, but he's also merciful. 
anyone who will choose to come to him, he's like, all of all of that, that all of your good works that you tried, that's not good enough, but I make you good enough. I will give you a clean slate, a clean record. I'm the one who will make you right with God. I'm the one who will wash away your sin. I'm the one who gives eternal life. And this should actually free you up and go, whoa, it's not by me. Because when we look into our own hearts, we know that we're not good. We know that we fail. If we think that we have to get right with God by the good things that we do, we're going to get really discouraged because we fail. We break God's commands. But Jesus, he does not fail, right? Okay, so let me move on so that we can close here. Uh, he goes on and says, do not, verse 45, do not think that I will accu accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, these Jews, they thought Moses, they almost lifted Moses up to almost be like a God. There was God and then Moses and then other prophets and then, you know, people. So they had like this authority that got Moses. Oh, they almost worshiped Moses. And so what Jesus is telling them is Moses wrote about me thousands of years earlier. Okay. And again, going back a few weeks ago that I mentioned Jesus, when he told the woman at the well, when she said, we know that the Messiah is coming and he says, I am he. And he uses that, that phrase, I am in the Greek, echo ime. And he's going back to Exodus 3.14. Of, of, of Yahweh who spoke out of the burning bush. And Jesus says, I'm that person. He's talking here. Moses wrote about me. You think Moses is great. Well, Moses talked about me. And, you're, and you don't believe what he has to say about me. So you don't have life. So Jesus is being very hard on these people because he's rejecting them. But he's also very compassionate too because some of these people will end up believing in him. They'll see, oh, no, we were wrong, and they will accept him. And this is what God wants from us. He wants us to see where we're wrong so that our, our thinking is changed. That's part of repentance is changing the way you think about sin uh, and, and then turning away from that. So he's wanting to show us where we're wrong. It's not you're not right with God by what you do. You become right with God by what Jesus has done and you putting all your confidence and trust and faith in Jesus. And then he will begin to live good works out through us, through the Holy Spirit. We cannot do good without the Holy Spirit. OK, so the last thing I want to do is I want to look at this last two verses for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Okay, well, let's, I want to look at, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, where in the world did Moses write about Jesus? I thought, I want to take some time to just look. Because Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. Let's look at where he wrote about him. Okay, we're just going to look at one verse from each book. Okay. And we'll try to go through this quickly. So Jesus in the book of Genesis. Okay. This is the very first book of the Bible. Uh, this verse, uh, I will explain. Okay. Cause it is hard to see. Well, how, what, how is this about Jesus? Okay. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, now you might ask, what in the world is this talking about? This is in the garden when God is with Adam and Eve, the first two people God created. And God had told them, don't eat from this tree. 
You can eat from any tree you want, but don't eat from the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do this, then you will die and be separated from me. Okay? So, he has just come back in the garden and they have eaten from the fruit and God comes and they're hiding. And at the time, the Bible said they didn't have any clothes on. They were naked. And then when they ate from this tree, their, their, their eyes were open, it said, and they realized, oh no, they had shame. So they tried to cover themselves. And God comes to them and he's like, why do you, who told you that you were naked? Why do you have fig leaves cover, covered all over you? And then they, they go on and explain. And, and Eve blames the devil. Oh, the snake. He told me to eat and I ate. And then Adam, he blames Eve. The woman you gave me, she made me do it. <laughs> do you guys ever do this? You blame other people for your sin. Right? Oh, my friend, they told they 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 invited me to go to that place with them that I, you know, we shouldn't have gone. It's their fault. If they wouldn't have invited me. No, well you you went. Right? So what God is telling them is this, okay? God makes a pro he curses the snake and he, he's making a prophecy and telling them a prophecy is a prediction about the future. And he tells Adam and Eve right there, they have just been <laughs> realized, oh no, what have we done? We have sinned against God. And God said, I told you, if you did this, you would die. And he's and he tells them, Okay, the, the snake, ultimately the devil, the serpent, he said, I'm going to curse him. Okay, and he says to Eve, one of your children, your offspring, one of your descendants, he will bruise the head of this, of this, uh, the enemy, the devil. He's going to destroy him. Okay. And the devil, the snake, will bruise his heel. This is a prophecy about how Jesus, when he would come die on the cross. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, it was like a, a, a blow to the head of the devil. He destroyed the devil. If you get hit in the head, you're gone, right? So he's saying J Jesus is going to destroy the devil. And he's ultimately talking about it at the cross. But that death that Jesus uses to destroy the devil will be like a bruise to his heel. Now, Jesus died a terrible, horrible death and was separated from his father. But what Jesus went through doesn't compare to what God's going to do to Satan or what he did to Satan on the day of judgment at the cross. So when, when Jesus died on the cross... He defeated the devil on your behalf and my behalf at the cross. He defeated death and made a way for us to be forgiven. Now, Moses wrote this. This was, all, this was about Jesus, okay? Let's look at the... Where did Moses write about Jesus in Exodus? Now, I'm only giving you five verses out of these five books. If you read... Genesis through Deuteronomy, you can see Jesus all over the pages, glimpses of him. Anytime you see a sacrifice, something paying for the sins of, of someone else, like a lamb being sacrificed, that's ultimately pointing to Jesus, what he would one day do. So Exodus, okay, I'm not going to read it all. You can, you, got, you can all read this later. But in Exodus, this is talking about the Passover lamb where God came to the Israelites and he said, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to come and I'm going to kill the firstborn of every son. But if you take blood and you put it over the doorpost. Then when I come, I will pass over your home and I will not destroy anyone in the home. If if you take the blood of the lamb and he was he gave a. a detailed description of the kind of animal that had to be sacrificed. It had to be a lamb. Uh, it says without blemish. That means no spots in it. 
It had to be a perfectly solid color, no broken bones, no uh, deformities, no you know foot that was shorter than the other one. It had to be perfect because that was actually a picture of Jesus who was perfect. He was the perfect lamb. He was sinless. He was without blemish in his heart. Jesus' heart was perfect. He never had sin. So Moses was writing about Jesus here in this passage. The Passover is ultimately about Jesus, who when we come through the door of Jesus, as it says in John 10, 9, he says, I am the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved. We're, it's like Jesus' blood is covering us. So God's judgment passes over us, right? Okay. So Moses wrote about Jesus in Exodus. He wrote about Jesus in Leviticus when he gave the, the laws that when someone sins and breaks God, God's commands, then something has to cover their sin. Death has to be paid for sin. So God came, uh, revealed to them five sacrifices in the book of Leviticus that they could make that would substitute in the place of the sinner and cover their sins. Okay, this is just one. It's called the burnt offering. He said he had the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the grain offering, and I think the wave offering or something like that. There was five. Okay. And he gives a description in the Old Testament. You, because you have sin, something has to die in your place. So he said, take an animal, a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting and he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. That word atonement means covering. Ultimately, this was pointing that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would come and die for us and he would atone. He would cover our sin so that God's judgment when it comes, it doesn't come on us because Jesus already took it. See, so Moses was writing about Jesus in the book of Leviticus. In the book of Numbers. Whoops. Okay, I won't read this whole thing. I shared this story when we looked at John chapter 3. In the book of Numbers, the, the Israelites were out in the wilderness and they were really complaining against God. They were complaining that they were out there uh, walking around in the desert, God had said, I'm going to send you to this promised land. And they kept complaining. So God just kept them walking around for 40 years, not allowing them to get somewhere that it should have only taken maybe a, a couple months to get to from Egypt. Okay? And they're complaining. So God sends these snakes, these poisonous snakes, and they bite the people and they start dying. Okay? And they come to Moses. It says, And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And we saw this in John chapter 3. Jesus told Nicodemus when he talked about how he needed to be born again. He said, just like Moses lifted up the snake on the pole in the desert, he said, so the Son of Man must be lifted up and everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. And Jesus was, set, was ultimately saying, just like in the book of Numbers, all the people had to do was look at this pole and they would be healed immediately. Jesus says, "If you, I will be lifted up on the cross and die for you. And if you look to me in faith and believe in me, then you'll be healed eternally from sin. See, the book of Numbers spoke about Jesus. Okay? And last, the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? Moses said, uh, or God tells Moses this, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded you. This is talking about Jesus, okay? 
And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So he's saying he will judge them. So ultimately, I know that I've been talking a lot today about a lot of different things. Okay? But ultimately, what Jesus is revealing to these people is that if he just claims to be the Son of God and the Savior, don't believe him if he's the only one who says it. But John the Baptist said it, who the people looked up to as a good prophet of God. God the Father says it. His own works reveal who he is. Moses says it, and ultimately the whole Bible says it. So Jesus is saying, you have no excuse in rejecting me. It's all over everything. Now, there's people nowadays who will say, now, Jesus was just a good man. I don't believe it. Okay? Well, ultimately, they're rejecting. They're rejecting the Word of God. And that's why Jesus said on the Day of Judgment, ultimately, the Word of God is going to judge people. Right? Because God has given us His Word. Now, some of you know there's, there's places where people have not received the Word of God yet. And in Romans chapter 10, it says, How shall they call on whom they've never believed? And how shall they believe in whom they've never heard of? And how shall they hear without someone telling them, without someone preaching? And then it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. This is why we need to go and tell people. Some of you come from countries where God is going to send you back to your own countries for the purpose of sharing the truth with your people. Some of you, God's going to send other places. Some of you who are going to Canada, Canada is a very wicked place. It's next to my country, which is becoming very wicked. Okay, Most uh, are not believers. I would say in either country anymore. Uh, God is going to send some of you to reach those people. God is going to send some of you, you know, to, to Israel and to some of you will go, I guess, to Qatar and different places. You need to, to remember that God is sending you out to share Jesus because he's the only one that can bring eternal life. It's not through our good works. It's not through our... Uh, appeasing the gods through sacrifices and things that will never that will never pay it's never enough only perfect blood only perfect the perfect blood of Jesus could be could take away that so i'm challenging you as we look at our questions you know what is Jesus revealing to you about who he is again as we we've been talking every week about what does he want you to know? Some of you have not yet accepted Jesus. You're still kind of thinking, you're learning, you're, you're coming. You're maybe a little skeptical, like, I like coming here and getting really good food, <laughs> free Wi-Fi, <laughs> being with nice people. I like this, but you still have not come to Jesus. I'm challenging you, encouraging you. God is speaking to you. If you're here, it's for a reason. It's not by chance that you just happen to come here or get invited here. God has brought you here. You, you've been chosen. In the book of uh, it's First or Second Thessalonians, it says, God has chosen you, and this is how I know God has chosen you, because you're hearing his word with power. If you're here today and you're hearing God's word, God has chosen you. Now you have to make the choice whether you're going to choose him. He's calling out to you, come to me. Like we talked about last week in Deuteronomy 30, 19. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. Jesus, where Jesus is, there's life. If you choose Jesus, you have life. You have blessing. You have life. If you reject Jesus, you have curse and you have death. Ultimately, separation, shame. Can you imagine standing before God and every person that has ever lived on the face of the earth 
We're going to all be at the judgment. Standing before Him and Him putting your sins, speaking them out, do you talk about shame? Everyone sees it. But Jesus was put to shame and you don't have to be put to shame on the day of judgment. Right? But if we reject Him, we will be put to shame. We will be have to pay for our sins. So that's why I'm challenging you today. If you hear God's voice, it says in the book of Hebrews, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you hear me, ultimately God saying to you through me, come to Jesus, believe in him, and you hear that voice and you can feel his Holy Spirit tugging on you. Yes, I need to make this choice to reject my idolatry, to re reject my old way of thinking, to reject my trusting in my own good works. Okay? God says, today if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. You can harden your heart. That means you can reject and your heart becomes hard and the next time you hear, you'll be harder and the next time you hear, you'll be harder and the next time you hear, you'll be harder and harder and harder. Okay? You need to accept Jesus while your heart is soft. Because the Bible does speak, if you read the prophets, God said there will be a day those who reject God where their hearts are so hard when they do hear, or, or he'll, they can't hear. Okay? So you don't want to get to a place where your heart is so hard that you've rejected Jesus, and you're like, no, no, no. No, no. And eventually, you're not going to be able to even hear anymore. Right? That's a bad place to be. And none of us know where that is. God can soften a heart as well. That's hard. I believe God's merciful all the way up till your death. You know, if you come to Christ, I believe that He will accept you. But don't harden your heart. Accept Him if you have not. Okay? Let's pray and then we'll be done. Okay? Jesus, we come before you. We just lift up to you, God. I praise you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your word that you reveal to us. You give us many reasons to believe in you, Lord, not just one reason. All of Scripture, Lord, has pointed to you, Jesus, as to be our Savior and our Lord. And we can trust you, Lord. I pray for those who don't know you. They put their faith in you, Jesus. And those who do, you'd comfort them, Lord, knowing that you keep them, that they are your children, that you love them. Lord, that you know what it's like to go through suffering. You know what it's like to be rejected even by your own family. Lord, you know what it's like to be rejected by those that you love. Lord, when you were... Dying on the cross, you even said, my God, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And you, you even had forgiveness for the people who put the nails in your hands and your feet because of your great love. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for everyone here. Please help those here, Lord. So many of them are going through difficulties and just struggling being away from family and uh, so many of them are looking for new jobs, Lord, or, or whatever they're dealing with, God, we pray that you would comfort them, help them, help them to know that they can trust you, Lord. They can wait on you to, to answer their prayers, Lord. Help them not to give up. Sometimes you don't answer our prayers in the time that we want, but you have a reason why. And... Just help us to be able to accept, Lord, your will in our lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.